Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, a new discovery was announced at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, a, a result which is literally world-changing. However, it isn't changing our world. If you've been paying attention to the night sky in recent weeks, you might have seen Venus passing close to Jupiter as they passed each other in the night sky, looking pretty amazing. Well, this new discovery is at Venus. And the funny thing is, it has been made with data which is older than many of my many of the audience members. So as many of you know, Venus is very similar to the Earth. It's very close in terms of diameter. It's a bit lower in mass. It doesn't have a magnetic field. It has this incredibly thick atmosphere. The atmospheric pressure at the surface is something like 80 times that of the planet Earth, equivalent to being 800 meters or half a mile underwater. And that thick atmosphere, of course, means that solar radiation gets trapped and the surface temperature is very, very high. Hot enough to melt lead, is what they famously say. So for a long time, Venus's surface was hidden from probes. The Soviet space probes would get down to the surface, they would confirm things like isotope ratios, but we didn't really have a good map of Venus until the Magellan spacecraft went there. And it was able to use synthetic aperture radar to peer through those clouds to get reflections from the surface and create the first maps of the planet Venus. And it showed a surface unlike any of the other planets. For a start, it was missing the numerous impact craters we see on other worlds. It didn't have the sort of continental plate with the land and the oceans that we see on Earth. The geology of Venus is really dominated by volcanic features. But the question has always been, are these volcanoes still active? And finally... After years after this data was taken, we have some evidence of geological activity from the Magellan data. So this region contains two peaks. It contains Ozamons and Mat Mons. And a scientist who was bored in Zoom meetings took it upon himself to go looking at this data and compare data from eight months apart. And he didn't write any code to it. Apparently, he was just looking at this during those, um, well, all that long downtime while someone else is talking and you're itching to get work done. And he found that in the eight months difference between two sets of data, that there was one caldera which changed significantly enough to be seen from a spacecraft from orbit. The caldera basically doubled in size. It was about 2.2 square kilometers, and by uh, eight months later, it was about four square kilometers. And then by reprocessing some of the data and looking at elevation changes, they thought they found some evidence that there may be new lava flows. Now, they couldn't preclude that these lava flows had previously existed because these two uh, radar images were taken from different angles. And it's possible that the reflectivity changed because of you know different incident angles, different points of view. But if these lava flows were new, they would cover an area of about 70 square kilometers. And if we compare this to, say, the 2018 eruption in Hawaii, the, this change in the caldera size was actually roughly comparable, but the amount of lava flows, there was only like 35 square kilometers of lava output in, in Hawaii. Although, to be fair, a lot of that lava stopped when it hit the ocean, which does tend to put a damper on uh, your lava flows. So finding active volcanism on a 30-year-old data set would be a big deal. And they really wanted to check that what they were seeing made sense. What they did was they went back and they created uh, simulated SAR images. The thing about synthetic aperture radar is that depending upon the angle, you can frequently get things appearing which uh, are synthetic. The right, okay, synthetic in a different way. The, there can be problems, there can be foreshortening in you know, steep slopes. And, you know, we all know the problem of different view angles and illumination in planetary sites. If you remember the face on Mars, that came from Viking images, and there was a great deal of discussion and, well, straight up conspiracy theories that sprung up surrounding it until later we finally got an, illumina uh, an image from the same location with better illumination showing that it was indeed just random uh, shadows that made it look like a face. So they started building you know, simulated models of craters. One of the things about this uh, data was that the first set of data had been observed in one direction and the second set in the opposite direction. And since you've got these things looking down at an angle, there could be some steep slope which 
is invisible in one direction and makes the crater look bigger in the other. And yeah, so they built these models and they decide that there's a pretty good chance that this change in the crater is absolutely real and authentic. And that would point to a large change in a volcanic style structure in eight months, logically suggesting that we have active volcanism on the planet. Now, the mechanism by which this changed, it's not clear. It could be that there was an eruption. It could be there was a lava lake when it was observed at one time and then the lake drained. Or it could be there was subsurface lava chambers which drained out and then the caldera collapsed. We saw this happen again in Hawaii. This is only one event. There might actually be more lurking in the data out there. This was an entire planet that was explored 30 years ago. And frankly, the tools to process large amounts of data and compare it just haven't really been there for a long time. That bored scientist, whose name is Robert Herrick, he uh, thinks that he only looked about 2% of the data that's there. And that means there's a whole lot more sitting out there. This comes back to something I've said. If you want to be an astronomer or a planetary scientist, you don't necessarily need to have a brand new telescope or space probe. There are copious quantities of data out there for you to do your own research. The flip side of this is the data is 30 years old and we haven't really had much Venus data since then. In fact, this week we also found out that Veritas, another mission which was being built by JPL, has essentially had its funding cut down to just supporting the planetary scientists for now until JPL can finish with Psyche and sort out what went wrong with that. Then they might start getting their money again so they can build the, vision, the mission. And that does give me some eerie parallels with Magellan in the 1980s. That was a time when uh, the US government wasn't interested in paying for planetary exp exploration. And Magellan literally had to be built from spare parts. They actually took pieces from museums and used them in tests to verify the thing would work. It had hardware from Galileo and Voyager on board. It's looking right now that we won't really get any more Venus missions until like the 2030s. That's when we expect uh, the Da Vinci lander to actually get visit Venus. And we are also expecting a spacecraft called Envision that will be a European spacecraft with a JPL built synthetic aperture radar, which will give us an even better, higher quality map of the surface for us to explore. And of course, that will now give us 30 years of time lapse to look for changes on the surface. That being said, I won't be surprised uh, given the small coverage, if people don't find other changes on the surface that happened during the time when Magellan was there. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.